So, let's go to these lyrics. There's a thousand voices saying the time is now. I think that's funny, given that I went to an Abraham <laughs> workshop yesterday where there were a collective of voices speaking. Uh, it was interesting too yesterday, you know, <clears throat> the idea of channeling a collection of voices, um, you know, I guess that works for her and for, for people. Uh, for me, that's just recognizing that one source that speaks through all of us. But I also noticed that there are people now, young people mostly growing up, who want to be referred to as they. Do you all know that? So there's not just he, she, there's they. They want to be referred to as they. And I connected the two yesterday. I went, maybe there's something going on here that kids growing up are starting to go, wait a minute, I'm not just one thing. I'm everything. I'm all of it. I'm they, not just I. And, and maybe there's this new resurgence that people are tired of feeling like they're this one little entity in this vast world of many. And they're like, no, 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 I'm them. I'm all of it. So I think there might be something coming forward here that isn't as crazy as it may sound. Because I know many people have said, why do they want to be called they? Are they schizophrenic? <laughs> no, maybe they're God. Anyway, yeah. right? So it's just another way of giving ourselves the opportunity to... Um, start respecting what's coming through people and start respecting the differences as opposed to wanting to be comfortable in the sameness. So there's a thousand voices saying the time is now. Let go of the world you know. First of all, I love that. Let go of the world you know. If there's any time this month for you to really step into an understanding that I know nothing, now what can I know? I think we spend way too much time thinking we know it all. How many of you know it all? <laughs> oh, I can't believe some of you read your hand. So that's good. So Kevin raised his hand, and, and Kelly raised his hand. Please stand up. <laughs> so what I will say is they're the only two that got it right. You do know it all. Wait, you. Wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kevin does remind me often that he knows it all. Um, but we do. We do. There is that in us. There's a place in us where we know it all. Now, if we're willing to forget the human idea of this, this, I have to know it all because I have to know all the information and make my decisions. If we can let go of that, we actually know it all. And now we'll find out what we really do know if we're willing to let go of what we think we know. Because notice I said to you, I let go of what I think I know in order to know what I know. So I think we have kind of confined ourselves into this understanding of what everything is to the degree that we're not willing to open up to seeing what everything is. That's what we get to discover this month particularly, and this year in whole. So let go of the world you know. There's something waiting for you in the great unknown. Now, here's the question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there is actually something waiting for you in this world? Do you believe that there's way more to your life than what you are now experiencing? Yeah. How many people agree with that? Yeah. We all think that, right? There is more to my life than what I am experiencing. Right now in my life, I tend to be focused on something. You know, but I'm realizing I'm focused on the wrong something. Not wrong, I don't wanna make myself wrong or right, but to the something that's not really serving me at my highest, and I will talk about that a little bit. So it's, I love this line, you're never gonna grow by doing what you're told. Now I hate to say this almost to the, with any of the kids in the room, but, <laughs> but you know what? We were all kids at one point, right? And at some point, we stopped listening to what we were told because it didn't work for us. Can we all relate to that? Yes, Most of us, well, first of all, you're sitting in a religious science church. I'm pretty sure none of you grew up in one. So, well, you did, okay, Mary. So, <laughs> there's something about Mary. Um, so, now I can't get that image out of my head. So, 
so, so, so at some point, we stopped listening to what we were told about religion, about God, and we ended up here. We ended up somewhere. So all of us, at some point, stop listening to what we're told because something else is coming through. Yes? Yes. yes? Why are we stopping that? Why do we think we've arrived? Because, I mean, how long did it take for Eric to get me to stop mocking him and actually go listen to what he was listening to? I mean, I won't stop mocking him, but I will. <laughs> but I will pay more attention to that, and I actually even want to read some of it. So it really is about... Are we willing to open ourselves up to what to the great unknown and realize there's something waiting for me if I open my mind and stop thinking I know what I know? It's a real trap for ministers. It's a real trap for ministers and teachers because we tend to think what we're teaching is correct. I know that what I'm teaching is correct for this moment. And most of my students will tell you, I have very often come in the next week and said, yeah, that doesn't work anymore. How about this? Now, some people, it drives them crazy because really they just want to know what's the answer. Well, the answer is there's a question. That's the answer. Right? And if we're not willing to do that, we will go the way of Christian science, which is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because it has one thing to teach and won't allow anything else to be known from it. Which, by the way, what it teaches is good. It's right. It's great. But it's not expanding into a new world. And sometimes religious science is doing that too. We're not willing to open up to what's new, to what it is, in a, world, in a religion that was basically founded by a man who said, there is no one answer, it's all of it. So that's our job, and this year is a great year to do this. You're never gonna grow by doing what you're told. So this year is the month of discovery. And my little slogan is, I discover the unseen in 2019. It's on your book, on your little pamphlet that we finally got out today. I discover the unseen in 2019. There's a lot that we don't see and we need to discover it. Everything is not right here for our senses. There is stuff on the inside that needs to be seen because once you see it on the inside, it'll show up on the outside. That's the way this law works. So this, this Thursday in a ministerial class, I'm very focused right now on practitioner work, on what it is to be a practitioner, what is treatment, how does it work? Are we capable of using our minds in such a way that we shift energy? Can I sit with you and know the truth about you and in knowing so rise, raise my elevated energy? Yes, I can. Can you feel it when I'm doing it? Yes, you can. If you are receptive and if I'm in the right space, it can happen and it must happen, and that's who we are. That's what we're founded on, our ability to do this. Are we doing it as practitioners? Probably at least 50% of the time, no. We're just speaking words. We're not really getting into the energy that we can get into. We're not really moving energy, because if we were, there would not be so many things going on in lives that were not preferable, because we'd be revealing the truth, and once the truth is revealed, it must demonstrate. So if it's not demonstrating, it's not being revealed. Our energy's not being moved. So I'm very focused on that. So on Thursday in ministerial class, I had all the new ministerial students pair up and go move energy. Go do it and come back and talk to me about it. Well, they all paired up and there was Reverend Helen in Toronto was left. And I said, oh good, you get the next 15 minutes to just relax. And she said, or I could treat you. And I went, okay. So I went into the uh, control room for privacy, at which point I forgot to realize I was being recorded, and <laughs> <clears throat> sat there, told her what I was feeling, which was that it was getting harder day by day, not easier, and I wasn't prepared for it to get harder day by day to deal with Nora. And, and I finished talking to her, and you know, ministers, when they work with a practitioner, are really annoying. Because I tell her what the problem is, then I tell her what the solution is, and then I tell her what I will treat, what she should treat for, and I, I pretty much micromanage the whole thing. And when I finished, I went, but, but I'd really like to hear what you think you should treat for. <laughs> and remember, Reverend Helen is my student. I, I, she went through ministerial with me. So she said, well, James, I would like to treat for surrender. 
She goes, now you're gonna think I mean, I'm, I would like to treat for you to surrender to what has happened, to surrender to Nora's passing, surrender to this accident, surrender to the life you are now living. She goes, but that's not the surrender I'm talking about. Now she had no idea what this talk was about today. She said, I'd like you to surrender to what you don't know about all of this. In other words, I'd like you to surrender to the unknown. And I was like, have you read my notes? I was, I was like, wow, that's a great idea. And instantly I felt a relief. I was like, I'm focusing on why, why, why did she die? Why was it, t she, was too, she was too young, she had so much to do. I have all that going on, but over here is the answers to that, the unknown, the stuff I don't know. I can't get these answers. I'll, I may never know these answers in the world of form, but they exist in the unknown. So surrender to the unknown. And when she did that, my whole energy was like, oh my God, yes. And it had taken so long for her, for me, for her to get me to stop talking that I'd given up my 15 minutes so she didn't get to treat for me. <laughs> but it didn't matter because she was treating for me because she knew the truth and the truth elevated my energy. That's what I'm talking about, the unknown. Being willing to take your mind, your attention, off of the relative world of facts. Do you all have facts in your lives? Don't you all have tons of facts in your lives that you are focused on? Things that identify you, that you know make you who you are? Things that are happening in your world. How many of you have things that you're working on right now in your world? How many of you have to go to work tomorrow? How many of you have things to accomplish? Right, so we focus a lot of our time on that. What about all that stuff that's not that? What about opening up to all of that part of our lives? Because frankly, as soon as we do, this all falls into place beautifully. So, the question is, when she said surrender to the unknown, the question for me was, how do I do that? How do I actually surrender to the unknown? How do I, how, how do I make myself willing enough to start hearing this when I'm so pulled over here? I am so pulled this way. When something happens in your life that is so dramatic, so that really affects you, you tend to get pulled to those facts. How do I stop myself from being pulled over here and allow this to, 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 to be a, a healing balm on my identity, my energy, who I am as a person? How? And I know that's the question you all wanna know because that's why we're all sitting here. How do we do this? How do we use our minds as a tool of energy to move ourselves into that place where all we have is discovery? How do we do it? Well, it was perfect because the chapter two, which is this week, is the way it works. Ernest Holmes tells us the way it works and he says this, as much good as any individual is able to incorporate into his or her life is theirs to use. As much good as you are able to incorporate into your life is yours to use, which simply means if you are willing to focus on that which you say is good, that's what will show up in your life. But how often do we spend our time focusing on that which we don't like? How often do we get caught up in the he said, she said, this person did this to me, this happened? What do you think you're creating from all of this? So it's so simple. As much good as you are willing to incorporate into your life is yours to use and experience. That's what he says. He says, that's the way it works, which puts it all on you. And then he says this, we shall find a better God when we, we shall have arrived at a higher standard for man. We blame God so often. In my old life, God was really the person you could blame for everything. Remember that? I kind of miss that God. I do. Sometimes I, really, I, sometimes I really envy the Catholics because they can just blame it all on God. It's God's fault. It, it, I, I've done everything right. It's God's fault. You know, I know because my family tell me that. But if I get to say it's all me, how much good am I going to bring into my life? And I love when he says here, you'll arrive at a better God when you arrive at a better you. Because guess what? You're it. But most of us don't believe that or we believe it in different degrees. I just said to someone yesterday, every problem you have, everything you are working on boils down to one thing. 
there is a part of you that still doesn't believe you are God. Therefore, you will find, look for, search for what you need out here and it doesn't exist. Because what you are looking for, you are looking with. What you think is going to save you already has. You just don't know it. That's where we are. And that's what Ernest Holmes is saying. And that is the way it works. And so it's quite a quagmire at times, isn't it? The very thing you want to accomplish, you already are, so you're looking for it, and yet it's here, and you can't find it. What's that joke that someone says, God played a joke on mankind because he put the truth inside of him, the only place he wouldn't look. <laughs> but I think we've evolved past that. So here's the whole thing. How does it work? You know, it's like, how does it work? The way it works. How does it work? It works by listening to you. That the thing itself that we talked about last week, God, the law, is listening to you. All the time, by the way, 24-7. There's no room you can go into where that that you are doesn't listen anymore. Oh, the, oh that there would be. Where you could go, I'm gonna step into this closet and bitch and moan, and no one's gonna hear this, God won't hear it. This will have no repercussions on my life. It just doesn't happen. Nope. It listens to everything you say. Now, does it demonstrate everything you say? You've, how many people have seen The Secret? I love that moment in The Secret where the elephant shows up because the guy thinks of an elephant. That would be kind of crazy if everything showed up. But on the collective, everything you say, based on what you believe, has a, a general overall um, premise. That's what shows up in your life. So the, fr the thing is, you have to be on top of everything you are thinking. You have to be awake, aware, alert. And I know some of us say, I know this is creating, but I'm doing it anyway. Well, okay, but then you cannot complain when your life turns upside down. And you certainly can't, any of you sitting here today, you can't say, how did this happen? <laughs> because here's the answer. Look in the mirror. That's how it happened. Because you happened it. Is that a word? Okay, good. You happened it. I like that. So, it works because it listens to you. Now, it's listening to your beliefs. So, Esther Hicks yesterday said this. I told Eric, I said, I'm going to quote her tomorrow. You'll see. <laughs> she says, what you're going to believe is what you practice believing the most. I know, think about that for a second. What you are going to believe in your life is what you practice believing the most. The thing is, you're practicing believing without even knowing it. Every time you have a conversation with someone and you start telling them your story, you know that story you tell of how life got to be the way it is in your world. Usually it's her fault or his fault. Usually it's the parents. Something, something happened that turned you into who you are and you're telling the story. That's you practicing what you believe. And when you're doing that, practicing your storytelling, what you're really practicing is you are practicing the belief that you are a victim, can be victimized, and will be victimized because there are perpetrators in the world to victimize you. And by the way, here are their names. <laughs> right? So that's, that's what's going on. We have to get it clearly that this is one of the most brilliant things to understand about life, and when we put it into practice, now you're running your life, really running your life, and you're discovering that your life has the possibilities that you never even thought of before. So, Ernest Holmes says this, the thing itself can only become power to us when we recognize it as power. It is entirely a question of our own receptivity. How much of this can you receive? How much good can you receive? Well, let me ask you this. How much good are you receiving right now in your life? If you look at your life, how much good are you receiving? I'm receiving so much good. In the face of the worst thing I could have ever imagined in my life, I have received so much good. I walked in today and there was a banana on my chair. And I know that Anne Monaghan put it there because I am willing to receive Anne Monaghan's love. She makes sure I get my potassium intake every Sunday. 
And I, I, I'm saying that almost jokingly, but it's the truth. This is good coming to me. I recognize that as such. I recognize Anne as good coming to me. But I also recognize that I attracted Anne into my life. I attracted that banana onto that seat. And I will attract eating it on the way home. <laughs> this is what you have to be aware of. And this is what Ernest Holmes says. Are you aware everything coming at you, you've attracted into your life? So the question is, how much good are you willing to attract? If it's all you attracting it to you, how much good are you willing to bring your way? So one of the chapter headings in the second chapter is this. How much can we believe? How much can we believe? And I think that's what discovery is all about for me. I admit it, that I have been very closed-minded when it comes to certain things. You know, I like to, and I like to hide behind. I'm an absolutist. I don't believe in channeling. I don't believe in horoscopes, yet I read them. I don't believe, because they're fun. Uh, I don't believe in numerology. I don't believe in blah, 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 because I am an absolutist. Here's the irony I've just realized. If I believe that I live in an infinite universe and that everything is possible, how could anything be impossible? Can't be. And there are a lot of people that are following all of those modalities. Now, I may be drawn to one more than another, but to say there's nothing here closes me off. So our job this year is to stay open, not to follow every little thing that comes along as though that's one of the problems too. It's like, this is everything, this is it. No, all of it. What's coming through? Where's the authenticity? What feels good, what feels right to me? So in this second chapter of the way it works, it works because you work, because you are it, the way it works, meaning the way Preciosa works. How does she work? Well, she's a divine human being with a mind. That mind is always operating, but behind that mind is the oversoul the person using the mind, the, 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 the quantum energy using the mind that gets to say, I want my mind to focus this way on only that which serves me. That's the way it works. But what do you have to do to get there? You have to be willing to identify this, what I am, this divine human being. You have to be willing to, to identify the mind that you have, that is that which is the one mind operating everywhere. And then you have to be willing to know that behind it all is Emerson's oversoul that is literally the most powerful thing in the universe because it is everything and that you have the full use of it to focus your life from it. Well, that's a big journey to this and to operate from this. And that's why we say, are you operating from Christ consciousness, the highest level of consciousness? Well, if you are, <laughs> oh my God, the power you have. That's the power in the universe, greater than you are individually, that you can use. That's what Ernest Holmes discovered. That's the teaching he brought to us. And that's the way it works, right here in Preciosa. That's how it works. And it doesn't have to be this big thing outside of ourselves that we can't understand. That's how it works, individually, right here. She gets to use it that way, and she does. Except when she doesn't. And that goes for all of us. So the question is, what do you want to do with it? You're it. What do you want to do with it? So when he says, how much can we believe? He says, whatever you can believe, that much you can have. And his last paragraph is, let us realize and work with this sound knowledge and perfect faith that as high as we shall make our mark in mind and spirit, so high shall be its outward manifestation in our material world. As high as you are willing to go, that's as high as your life will manifest. It's really that simple. That is the way it works. Surrender to this great unknown. And then when you surrender to the great unknown, it will be known to you how massive and amazing you are. Accept the new. Accept the different. 
Question what you think constantly. Question what you think you know constantly. Allow yourself to be wrong. I will say that again. Allow yourself to be wrong. And then hold it all very lightly because as Delaney sang, there is something waiting for you in the great unknown. And you know what that is? It's you waiting for you to know you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you.